Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guest, our honorable guest speaker, our brother, our father, our son, our fellow Pan-African, our very own Professor Lumumba and his wife, Karibu Minnesota. I am thrilled this evening to share our platform with someone I've admired for so many years, a true catalyst who understands the incredible potential and possibilities of our time and for our Africa. Someone who understands the multisectorial and targeted interventions daily needed to lift us. Someone who believes our collective propensity to fuel the power to realize our maximum potential. Professor Lumumba is a dynamic speaker, an enigmatic speaker, who inspires us all, young and old, who challenges us to dream big and achieve more through improved governance and social justice, through diversity and inclusion, through economic leverages, youth empowerment, and women in leadership. His insights come from his vast work experiences in government, academic careers, and civil society. Professor Lumumba is a professor of public law, an author, and holder of LLD, Doctor of Laws on the Law of the Sea from the University of Ghent, Belgium. Also holds honorary degrees of Doctor of Letters from University of Cape Coast in Ghana and a degree of Doctor of Science from Bell's University of Technology in Nigeria. Professor Lumumba completed his Master's of Law degrees and Bachelor of Law degrees from the University of Nairobi, trained in human rights at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, Universities of Lo University of London in England. He studied humanitarian law at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of the University of Land in Sweden, and international humanitarian law in Geneva, Switzerland. With his legal credential, he has played critical roles in both academia and government. He is an advocate of the High Courts of Kenya and Tanganyika and a certified mediator. He is a fellow of the Institute of Certified Public Secretary of Kenya, a fellow of the Kenya Institute of Management, and an honorary fellow of the African Academy of, Sci of Science. He is the chairman of Arafina Investment Group in Monrovia, Liberia, and the Economic Strategic Growth and Development Initiative for Africa based in Nigeria. He is the former director and chief executive officer of the Kenyan School of Law, a former secretary of the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission, and a former director where is now Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. He plays a strategic law, role in our civic society. He is the founding trustee of the African Institute of Leaders and Leadership and founding chairman of the Association of the Citizens Against Corruption. He was the founding dean Kabarak University School of Law, a former lecturer at the University of Nairobi and the United States International University of Africa and Widena University in the United States, Nairobi Summer School. Dr. Professor Lumumba has received numerous international recognition, my favorite ones of all, a Lifetime of Achievement Award for Patriotism and Advocacy by the African Forum and a recognition by the new African magazine as the 100 most influential African. You wonder when he slips, right? Ladies and gentlemen, with thunderous applause and vigile gale, please join me in welcoming our guest, Professor Lumumba. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me start by acknowledging the organizers of this evening's gathering. I cannot mention everybody by name, but I've had the advantage of listening to the men and women drawn from different countries across the continent of Africa who have given testimonies. We speak to the residents of the mother continent in their hearts and minds. Let me also say how glad and humbled I am to have received this invitation 
to be present with you this evening and to share with you my thoughts on the role that the diaspora can and in my view must play in redefining the continent of Africa. It is very easy in a forum such as this and forums similar to this to talk about Africa as if it was an academic or intellectual curiosity. But that would be a luxury that one cannot and must not afford because Africa is real. It is real because it's the resident of nearly 1.5 billion human beings who many years ago have passed through many tribulations. It is the home of Africans who at one time were enslaved and one who wants to talk about history can talk about that and many have. Indeed, as I walked here, I had the advantage of seeing some of the most celebrated, celebrated books written by Anta Chek Diop, who speaks with greater depth about pre-colonial Africa. And one can talk about that. One can also talk about the history of the colonization of the continent and the impact that it has had and continues to have on the continent. But that is for another day. But yet there is a sense in which that colonization, colonization is what defines Africa in a fundamental way because the project is still alive and well when we talk about redefining Africa it must not be lost on us that the continent continues to be divided and undermined because of that very recent history of colonization we are the only continent in the world, as you well know, that still describes ourselves as Francophone, to mean that we speak French. So that if there was an African meeting, the Malian, the Mauritanians, the Togolese, the Beninois, the Gabonese, the Congolese, the Senegalese, the Tunisians, the Moroccans, the Chadians, the Bukinabe, and the Cote Ivoirians would describe themselves as francophone. These are things that divide us and define us. And those who claim to speak English, Kenyans, Ugandans, Tanzanians, Sudanese, South Sudanese, Malawians, Zambians, Namibians and many others including Zimbabwe would say that they are Anglophones and that too defines us and divides us. When you look at the Portuguese, the Cabo Verdeans, the Guinea-Bissau, the Angolans, the Mozambicans, 
would define themselves as Lusophones because they claim to speak English or rather speak Portuguese. And that defines and divides us. There is something that today is also described as Arabophone. Those who speak Arabic, if you go to Sudan, Egypt, to a certain extent Tunisia and Libya, and even Mauritania, they define themselves as such. I will not have mentioned Djibouti, I'll not have mentioned Somalia, I'll not have mentioned Ethiopia, I'll not have mentioned Comoro or seashells of Madagascar. But there is a sense in which that is how we define ourselves. One can speak about that when one is talking about redefining Africa and those of you who are in the diaspora. In a manner of speaking, the African question and African condition can be said to be one that is properly understood and well written about. Indeed, many times when I have the occasion such as this to speak about Africa, my mind normally goes back to the 23rd, 24th, and 25th days of the month of May 1963. At that time, 32 African countries had regained their independence or flag independence from their erstwhile colonizers. And the leaders who were present in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, on that day, to the man, interpreted and understood the circumstances of Africa clearly and articulated the circumstances eloquently that Africa having been humiliated having been abused by the colonizers had three clear enemies disease poverty and ignorance that is how clear the diagnosis of the African problem was. And it was there the collective view of the leaders of the day that the entire independence movement was going to be designed to address those issues. That because we had been abused so much, we would not allow our health care systems to collapse. That the leaders who are going to work to ensure that life expectancy improved. That they were going to ensure that maternal mortality was reduced. That they were going to ensure that infant mortality was eliminated and fundamentally is that the disease burden would be reduced if not eliminated. That is how clear the diagnosis was in 1963. They were also clear that ignorance was a contributing factor and that we had been so thoroughly under-educated or miseducated, as Carter G. Woodson had said a little earlier in 1933 of the American in his book, Miseducation of the Negro, which word you did not want to verbalize. And the most important thing was that we did appreciate that we had been miseducated, and so clear was the articulation of this. And if you go to many African schools and many African countries at that time, we built many universities. Those of you who come from uh, Liberia or Sierra Leone will know that in those early days, 
The universities that existed at that time were universities such as Fura Bay in Freetown, in Sierra Leone, which was a leading institution then and even now known as the Athens of Africa because it was the residence of knowledge. That was Africa identifying her problems. We also recognized that poverty was an issue. And we assumed that having regained independence, we would deploy our intellectual resources and our other resources to ensure that our men and women would not labor under economic desperation. Ghana regained our independence slightly over 60 years ago. And today, the question may be posed, has Africa conquered her identified enemies? Have the ghosts been exorcised? And if you look at Africa today, it is very easy to be depressed. It is easy to be depressed because, as I speak to you now, Many African countries do not know peace. And if they know something that is a semblance of peace, it is merely a lull before some storm. Look at Africa now. Look at Ethiopia, which we thought was moving in the right direction. After the civil war in 1984 when the Degg regime had been eliminated, we thought that Ethiopia had been immunized against conflict. Today, there is a fratricidal war going on there in Tigray. People are now identifying themselves not as Ethiopians, and there is no problem with identity, but this identity is of the negative kind. Tigre, because they are Amhara, our enemies. There is no peace and quiet in that land with 100 million Africans, which is a resource which could be deployed effectively. And if today you ask a young Ethiopian in Mekele, or in Lalibela, or in Addis Ababa, they would want to run away to some far distant country. And I'm quite certain that if you went to Eritrea, and you talked to some young man or woman in Asmara, they would want to run away to Dubai or to South Africa. But even in that South Africa that you want to run away to, look at what happened in the last one week. That country which was the beacon of hope, the home of the Cape of Good Hope, has now become the Cape of Hopelessness. Brother rising against brother, and suddenly that country that we referred to as the Rainbow Country, he is now producing thunder and lightning. And one wonders whether the dreams of the founding fathers of that nation, Albert Lutuli, Walter Sisulu, Governor Mbeki, Nelson Holisa, Samandela, and Chris Hani, whether that country will remain the country that we expected it to be. That depresses one. You go down, you go up a little, only one or two weeks ago, in the only absolute monarchy in Africa, in Eswatini, you saw what was happening in the streets of Mbambane. Africa is not at ease. And you go up north in Mozambique, that great land of Eduardo Mondlane and Samora Moises Marshall, up there in Cabo Delgado, we now have the entire population in disarray. This is Africa for you. And I'm trying to demonstrate that Africa can be depressing. And you don't stop there. 
go to the eastern part of Congo, you know, about two months ago, the Belgians said that they were returning the only physical remain of Patrice Emery Lumumba, his tooth. Somebody once said that until they bury Patrice Emery Lumumba, Congo will know no peace. Perhaps. Go to the eastern part of Congo. That is perhaps one of the richest countries on the continent of Africa. But the Congolese are happier when they are in Matonge in Brussels, in Belgium. They are running away. That is Africa for you. And if you go up north, the Central African Republic in Bangui, unrest. You go to Chad, unrest. You go to Burkina Faso, that land of Thomas, Isidore, Noel, Sankara, unrest. Go to Mauritania, unrest. Go to Mali, unrest. Go to Cameroon. The Ambazonians are not at ease. Go to Senegal, the Casamans, they are not at ease. Go to Nigeria. That is Africa. It can be depressing. And that is how I understand why many Africans sometimes leave the motherland in order to seek fortune elsewhere. But as the Osagie for Kwame Nkrumah said, even when you leave the mother continent, the mother continent resides in you. And that is why even when you are geographically separated from her, the good doctor, you must still have a medical scheme for your kit and kin several thousand miles away. That is why my good friend Lawyer Ongeri says, I cannot sit here in the comfort of Minneapolis, Minnesota. I must go back home and try to change the mother continent. You know, what you are doing is not new. Others have done it before. In the 19th century, Marcus Garvey of Jamaica tried to do the same thing. William of Trinidad tried to do the same thing. W.E.B. Du Bois tried to do the same thing. In his own unique way, Martin Luther King Jr. tried to do the same thing, not about physical migration, but about temperamental and intellectual migration so that you regain your self-esteem. Malcolm X tried to do the same thing. <laughs> Stokely Carmichael, who was mentioned here, have tried to do the same thing. Louis Farahan tries to do the same thing. My good friend Al Sharpton tries to do the same thing. There is a sense in which that thing to make Africa work is something that we cannot abandon. And you know, throughout history, it is the men and women in different civilizations who sojourned in far distant lands that brought a breath of fresh air to their mother continents. The Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma was here as a student in Lincoln. That is where the spirit of Pan-Africanism caught him. Namdi Azikiwe of Nigeria was here. And therefore, when we want and talk about redefining Africa, we must not allow what we consider to be the dark circumstances to dampen our spirit. This United States of America 
that many think is so great has gone through the valley of the shadow of death times without number. Is it not this United States of America that fought a war of independence? Is it not in this United States that you had a Boston Tea Party? Is it not this United States that had a civil war? Is it not this United States of America in 1963 that had a civil rights movement? Is it not this United States where George Floyd said, I cannot breathe? Is it not this United States? There is not a single nation on earth that does not go through trials and tribulations. Our Africa is going through our trials and tribulations. But even as we talk about those trials and tribulations, I can assure you that there are good things that are happening in the continent of Africa. If you have the honor and privilege of traveling through that continent, I do and I see beautiful things. You know, in 1994, and many of you know this story, many an Afro-pessimist had written an obituary about Rwanda after the genocide. Today, if you walk in the streets of Kigali in Rwanda, the streets are as clean as they are here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. <clears throat> and that is only 25 years. Many people may say many things about that administration, but they have demonstrated that when men and women are committed to an ideal, they are capable of changing their countries. So every time that you think that Africa is a lost cause, think about what the Rwandese did. A few years ago, many people thought that Tanzania could not function. You go to Dar es Salaam now, even if you doubt it, go to Dar es Salaam. Within five years of the presidency of Magufuli, you go and see the infrastructure that is there. And only two weeks ago, in fact, only one week ago, they have now ordered 32 electric engine trains from South Korea. <laughs> Within five years, while it had been projected that Tanzania would become a middle-level economy in 2025, they achieved that five years ahead of time it can be done it can be done you go to namibia in windhoek they may have their own problems but you go and see that it can be done go to Botswana, it can be done go to mauritius it can be done go to seashells it can be done go to senegal it can be done in other words, there are things that are happening. Even in our own country, Kenya, we have our own problem that there are certain things that are happening which are positive. You cannot wish them away. Go to Uganda and you'll see a few things that are happening that ought to be celebrated. Even in the troubled Ethiopia, there are things that are happening that can be celebrated. And that is why I hold the view. That in order to redefine the continent of Africa, we've got to understand that when you are looking at the life of any nation, never ever measure the life of a nation with your very short lifetime. You who are only capable of living at the very best at one for hundred years, how can you compare your life with a nation which will live for millions of years? You are just but a flash in the pan. You are here today and tomorrow we gather you to your fathers and mothers. So when you are talking about redefining Africa, think about Africa intergenerationally. I remember not so long ago, a year in fact, before President John Joseph Pombe Magufuli died had the occasion to have a long conversation with him at the State House in Dar es Salaam. And we had the occasion to talk about Africa 
And he asked me, half in jest and half seriously, what I had meant when during the Julius Kambaragi Nyerere lecture at the University of Dar es Salaam when I said magufulification, he asked me, what did you exactly mean? And I told him, this is what I meant. I meant that when I observed your activities before I met you, I got this feeling that you had successfully identified what is wrong with Africa and that included among other things that we must regain our self-esteem. We must begin to believe that we can do things. We must begin to believe that we must take care of our health system. We must begin to believe that we can build our roads, that we can produce things that feed us that we can add value to our natural resources. And I was saying that to the extent that you are faithful to that agenda, you are a magulified person. <laughs> and I believe that that is achievable if the continent has men and women who believe that Africa is capable of resolving her problems. And when we say some of these things, we do not for one moment believe that Africa is going to be a silo that does not deal with the world. We are simply saying that if we want to deal with the world, we must be prepared because history has demonstrated that fortune favors the vigilant. And I remember once again, in direct answer to your question, what it is that can be done. In the month of April, I had a, the privilege of having a long conversation with the president of Malawi, uh, President Lazarus Makathi Chakwera. And I told the president, the reason why I requested to meet you is because of the funeral oration that you gave at the funeral of John Joseph Pompey Magufuli. Because when I read your oration, you captured the mood of the moment. You are able to understand that in order for Africa to grow, Africa needs a certain kind of leader, a leader or leaders who are selfless. And therefore I come here to Malawi to ask you to give meaning to the word that you spoke. And he asked me, how do you want me to give meaning to the word that you spoke? He said, give meaning by allowing our foundation to make Malawi the hub of innovation and invention which can then be replicated across the continent of Africa. And he said, I give you that of opportunity and in the month of August next month I'll be meeting President Chakwera again to begin the process of creating an African hub for invention and innovation which will then replicate across the continent of Africa. In other words, it is not enough, as you rightly said, to merely criticize because criticize we can. It is not enough to merely critique because critique we can. It is not merely enough to lament because lament we can. It is not enough to intellectualize because intellectualize we can. It is not enough to philosophize because philosophize we can. But it is uh, sufficient that beyond the lamentation, beyond the intellectualization, beyond the philosophization, we must go out there and make the road meet the rubber. And the road only meets the rubber when we recognize that when we seek to achieve the things that will define our lives, we are going to make mistakes. But there is no comparison between that which is lost by trying and that which is lost by not trying. And that is why we believe that you who are in the diaspora have a duty. This afternoon, I was having a conversation with Dr. Bogonko about the beautiful thing that they are doing in healthcare. And I asked myself, they are doing this because some government in some African country is sleeping on the job.
and my good friend Hungary has already said it. It is not the duty of people in the diaspora to talk about health care when we have a ministry of health. But the gap is there and it must be filled and they are filling that gap. Then we got into the statistics and Dr. Bogonko and I wondered how much the United States of America spends on health care. And no sooner had we wondered than he googled. And he discovered through the googling process that the United States of America spent 3.8 trillion United States dollars on health care. That is per year. That is the total GDP of Africa this year. In fact, more. In other words, we all the money that we generate as the African continent, the 55 of us in the United States, it goes into health care and is not even sufficient. And that tells you that there is work to be done. Then he told me, that he is a member of a body of doctors in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And there are 12,000 of them. If you put together all the doctors in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, oh, they are fewer. <laughs> that is why we are still going to herbalists. Because there are no doctors. And I'm suggesting that that is an area of intervention. And that is why I hear you when you talk about the actual representation of Africans in the diaspora so that they can participate in the health care. My good friend, the good professor from Ethiopia will know that the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is a source of conflict between Ethiopia and Sudan and Egypt, has been partially financed by the Ethiopians in the diaspora. And if it works, it's going to generate 10,000 megawatts. You cannot talk about industrialization when you don't have electricity. You know, if you look at the, the, the traffic lights in Minneapolis, they are perhaps twice the number of traffic lights in all East African countries combined. And let me include Ethiopia and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the tragedy of our traffic lights is that they are there as monuments. They don't even work. And even when they work, nobody obeys them. Those of you who go home occasionally, whether you are in Liberia, whether you are in Sierra Leone, or Nigeria, or where, when you, you've got to go to Lagos, you've got to go to Abuja, or Anambra, or Enugu, or Kaduna, or Ogun State in Abeokuta, to know that nobody, people hate lights. <laughs> I am saying, therefore, that in that area, you have a contribution to make. As we were driving in Minneapolis, I saw something that looked like a farm. And I was told it is in the middle of town. And I was told that it is spinach that they were growing. And I was told by my host that it is not dependent on rain fed agriculture they know what amount goes into each plant and they produce spinach you come to africa and if you come to africa and you have had the fortune of reading the bible or the quran you will have seen how they used to plant in the olden days they take seed and throw it and some will fall on soil, some will fall on stone. That is how we still farm in Africa. And we believe that through that method we are going to feed 1.4 billion people. That is why as I speak to you there is food deficit in Africa. 
After the Tigray war, there is going to be famine. It is estimated that 4.5 million southern Sudanese are going to lack food. Indeed, as I speak to you now, the World Food Program is there in the entire Sahelian region. There is no food. And as I speak to you now, those you know, Lake Chad has shrunk by 70%. So that we are not only talking about the absence of food, but we are also talking about the absence of potable water. Which means that health burden is going to be higher. That is the Africa that you must come back to. That is the Africa that we must redefine. How can it be that a little country called Israel exports oranges to Kenya? Right now, you talked about Ethiopian coffee, you talked about Kenyan coffee, you talked about Rwandese coffee. Vietnam produces more coffee than all those countries combined. Vietnam. That is the Africa that we must redefine. I've said it before and I'm saying it again. Africa is a continent that produces what it does not consume and consumes what it does not produce. The textile industry in Africa is either dead or in comatose. Why? Because we Africans consume what Europe has rejected what America has rejected. Those of you who have the fortune of being in the United States of America, I believe periodically you throw away your genes. You throw away your undergarments. Oh, when they are thrown, they come to Africa. And we consume them gleefully. We wash them and say they are new. That is the Africa that you must redefine. Because how can you be dignified if that which has been rejected is what you celebrate? How can it be? And I'm suggesting to us that the only way we can achieve all these if, is if we begin to think differently. You have the fortune of being in this part of the world. They have their own problems. But their lights work. If you are in my Nairobi, <laughs> or in Accra in Ghana, or Abuja in Nigeria, or Monrovia, or Freetown, the light would have disappeared about five times since I started speaking. <laughs> Therefore, when you become the governor, make lights work. <laughs> it is not magic. It can't be done. The good Dr. Bogonko tells me, and I'll not say where he saw it, to be a good guest. But he went into some room which was described as an ICU. Africa has the penchant of describing things to be what they are not. <laughs> Since I came to Minneapolis, I've seen how the houses are built. No fences. Beautiful. If you are in any African country, there would be a six meter tall fence complete with broken glasses and dogs. In Nigeria, they would even have another gentleman called a gate man whose duty is to irritate you. <laughs> you have seen all these, we must change this. And this requires that we make a solemn vow. And what makes me glad as I conclude 
is that you have been able to identify the problems and that you are beginning to organize yourselves. That is the only way it's going to be done. Africa has also recognized this. We now have Africa Agenda 2063. We now have the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. But those are merely sterile pronouncements. This morning, as we flew from Fort Myers in Florida to St. Paul's and Minneapolis in Minnesota, a journey of three hours, 15 minutes, and I asked myself if I was moving from Nairobi in Kenya, I would have passed Tanzania and I would have met Tanzanian shillings there and I would have met a Tanzanian immigration officer there and I would not have stopped there I would have gone into Zambia and met their currency called the Kwacha and a set of immigration officers and I would have not stopped there I would have gone to Malawi in Lilongwe and I would not have stopped there, I would have gone down to Botswana. Five countries after three hours. With five different currencies. How can you grow? You can't. These unviable little African countries can only thrive if we eliminate the tariff and non-tariff barriers. The beauty of this United States of America is that you can decide today to leave here, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and go to Des Moines in Iowa and settle there, because it's one country. And you can leave Des Moines and go up to Duluth and work there. But you try moving from Nairobi in Kenya to Bujumbura in Burundi. <laughs> work permit. This is what holds Africa down. I want to go to Mogadish, work permit. I want to go to Hargeisa, work permit. I want to go to Ethiopia after one hour, 50 minutes, beer. <laughs> beer. And foreign exchange. You cannot grow. And it is you who have had the advantage of working in this part of the world that can change it. And your children, and I've had the conversation, many of your young children, when you take them home, you, they think that it is trial by ordeal. Because the circumstances, first of all, when you arrive in your typical African airport, it is that. I, I do not know our affinity as Africans to things that are dirty. Have you ever seen that? You get into an African airport, is, is this something that is untrue? You just wonder, things just don't work. And yet we know that they can work, because in a few African countries we see them working. So we must change this. So in a nutshell I'm saying that we have the duty and the capacity to redefine Africa. But don't redefine Africa, you your generation that came here, it must be intergenerational. If you do not bring in the young men and women, your children, your sons and daughters to be wedded to this idea of Africa, Africa will become a place that they go to wonder at how their parents and grandparents live. Yet Africa is the mother continent. And I tell young Africans, don't you wonder what has made Africa attractive all these years? Today, if you fly to Europe or fly from Europe, see the number of young Chinese between the ages of 20 and 30. And I have traveled in many African countries. I go to South Africa, I see young Chinese. And I see a Chinese restaurant. 
I go to Namibia, Chinese. Botswana, Chinese. Mozambique, Chinese. Zambia, Chinese. Senegal, Chinese. Ghana, Chinese. Nigeria, Chinese. Kenya, Chinese. Chinese are everywhere. Why? Because they know what they want. It is not the Chinese that we should blame, it is us. Because fortune favors those who seek. And if we don't seek, if we are engaged in sorrows and lamentation, and we think that God is going to come and rain man on us because we are praying and fasting, God is wondering at us. Because the divine instruction by God is you go out there and subdue the world by the sweat of thy brow. God is not in the business of magic. All the things that you can do are resident in your mind. Is the mind that is the standard of the man as MLK J.R. said. The aeroplane that you fly it came out of somebody's mind. It was resident here, there, it was woken up. These microphones came out of somebody's mind. Everything is a product of human thought. So ladies and gentlemen, I beseech you, you have come here in this land of plenty, but you have left a land of even more plenty. Don't forget that land, that land must never be forgotten, is the land that has given birth to all civilizations. That land called Africa. All of us came from there. Whether you want science to prove it for you, all of us came from Africa. Whether you want myth to prove it to you, all of us came from Africa. Come back. When I say come back, I don't mean you've got to be physically there, no. Even this is our land. Even this one. But don't forget and never ever cut the umbilical cord. It is easier said than done. But when the chips are down, I have no doubt in my mind that 400 million Africans in the diaspora are the ones who are going to change the world. You know, you may have your problems with the state of Israel or the Jews. But until 1948, there was not a nation called Israel. There was none. 1948. In 1948, Liberia was independent and had been independent for a long time. Ethiopia was independent and had been independent for a long time. Then in 1948, little Israel popped out in the Levant. A few years later, the economy, the GDP of Israel is larger than the entire sub-Saharan African per capita, excluding Egypt and South Africa. Why? Because even when they were in exile, they remembered that there must be a motherland. You must never forget that. You must never forget that. You must always have your true north. And Africa is not Israel. Africa is bigger than Israel. Africa is better than Israel. So ladies and gentlemen, when you go home, reflect. Those who have been bitten by the bug of African hood, go out there and say like Julius Caesar, Vene, Vidi, 
Vicky. I came, I saw, and I conquered. Those who have chosen to be here, like Yusuf, conquer here too. And once you have conquered here, share with us. Don't take everything away. Share some with us. And I hope that many of you who are here are going to engage your various embassies. Because African embassies are also infamous for men and women who think that their diplomatic assignments is for holiday. They don't work for the people. Engage them and tell them that they have a duty to facilitate you so that you can help the motherland. I hope that that will be done. Because an Africa that is redefined is an Africa that is going to be a strong participant in the world. When we say that Africa must be great, we are not saying that Africa must be great that she may conquer anybody. That is not the business of Africa. We are saying that Africa must be great so that she can participate in the affairs of the world on an equal footing with the others. And she can. If everything eluded us, let us be participants in the new revolution. The nanotechnology that we talk about, let us be partakers of it. We now have software engineers, we have doctors, we have people who are te technically savvy. Come and help the continent of Africa. Come and redefine the continent of Africa. It is waiting to be redefined and we all must participate in that grand agenda and it will be well with us. Because if we de don't define Africa, then we will be defined by others. And when you are defined by others, then you lose your humanity. And when you lose your humanities, you become a thing. And when you become a thing, you'll be abused and be humiliated. Choose you now whether you want to be human beings or you want to be things. God bless you.